Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about unstabilized approaches. What are they? What leads up to them? How do we mitigate against them? And towards the end, we're going to be looking at an accident, an actual case study where unstabilized approach was one of the reasons why the aircraft ultimately crashed. So stay tuned. One, three, one, zero, one, six, three, one, right, right, right. This video is brought to you in cooperation with my Patreon crew. The Patreon crew are the ones that really support the channel. Uh, they help me preview my videos, they help me to choose which thumbnails I should be using and which I shouldn't be, they tell me if something is off, and they provide financial support for the channel. Now, if you are interested in joining the crew and taking part of these discussions, then click the link up here and go in and see what it's all about. Good check. Bank angle. Bank angle. Flap inhibit switch to flap inhibit suite. Flap inhibit. Then we can put the terrain inhibitors as well. So guys, Unstabilized approaches, being hot and high. Um, these are all things that you would have heard about in the media during the last few weeks. And I felt that it's probably a good idea to explain what it is and what leads up to it and how we, the pilots, are actually trained to make sure that it doesn't happen. In order to understand unstabilized approaches, you need to understand that the aircraft basically has three different forms of energy when it's flying. You have potential energy, that's the aircraft's altitude. So the higher the aircraft climbs, the more potential energy it has. Then you have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has to do with the movement of an object. So in the case of an aircraft, as the aircraft accelerates, which it does as we're climbing up higher and higher, then the kinetic energy also increases. And the third energy state is the chemic energy state, as in that's what we have in our tanks, the fuel, because the fuel has the potential to be converted into energy and that's what we're using in order to increase our potential and our kinetic energy. So as we're cruising along at our cruising altitude, we might be at 450 knots of true airspeed and around 38,000 feet, that's when we have the maximum amount of energy. Now, all of that energy needs to be taken away in one way or another until we get down and stop at the end of the runway. So, we do this in several different ways. Obviously, when it comes to descending, we need to be aware of these energy states because you need to know how far away from your airport you need to start to descend. If you start to descend too late, it means that you are going to be too high when you're getting close to the airport. This has been the case in some case, and it has led to high energy approaches. And we'll get to that in a second. So the way that we calculate when to start a descent um, is using our onboard computer most of the time, our FMC. So the FMC knows how heavy the aircraft is. Obviously that's gonna have an impact on the overall energy state of the aircraft. The heavier, the more energy we have. Uh, it knows how fast we're flying. It also knows what winds that we are likely to encounter during the descent because in our pre-briefing material, we would have gotten a wind chart and as part of our preparation for the descent, we would sit and we would put the descent winds in at at least three different altitudes during our descent. And based on all of this, plus temperature outside, pressure outside, and all of the different parameters that we get through our different probes, it will calculate the most efficient descent. Right? So most of the cases, it's just a matter of us seeing where the top of descent is. Prior to that, we ask air traffic control for descent clearance. Hopefully we get it. And then we will just descend according to what air traffic control is telling us. But there are potential faults in here. There are potential things that can happen that can influence this. So for example, we tend to program the FMC with an anticipated arrival route. So this tends to be the standard arrival route, the star that comes into an airport. Uh, but in some circumstances, air traffic control might elect for efficiency, for example, to give us shortcuts, all right? So quite a bit of the pre-descent planning goes into discussing between the pilots whether or not we're anticipating to get any shortcuts. And if we are, then we need to reflect that in the FMC either by putting in an altitude restriction that enables the aircraft to take the shortcut or by just taking part of the route 
away because we know from experience of that airport that we're never going to fly it. And in that case, we also know how to put it back in if we would need to, right? But sometimes we still kind of get a surprise shortcut. And the problem with that is that if we have, this, if we have calculated with a much longer route, then the aircraft thinks that it has much more time to dissipate the potential energy, the altitude. And if it doesn't get that route, if it doesn't get those track miles, well then the energy state is going to be too high. And if we accept that shortcut, well in that case, when we get closer to the approach, we're going to be way too high in order to just get down. Because the aircraft, you can't just push a button and have the aircraft descending down to the altitude. You need to think energy. And in the case of the 737-800 that I fly, it is a really, really aerodynamically efficient aircraft. So it just does not descend and decelerate well at the same time. You need to kind of plan, pre-plan where you're going to do this. So this is one of the, I would say, one of the biggest reasons that aircraft ends up hot and high. That is because the air traffic control will offer a shortcut to the flight crew flight crew will take that shortcut without thinking and then you will end up much higher as you're trying to intercept the glide slope later on okay now the way to mitigate against this is a being aware of it so that you pre-plan for it b turning down the shortcut if you see that you can't make it you know air traffic control are trying to help by giving shortcuts but sometimes it is not helpful like in this case for example and in that case the only thing you need to do as flight crew is tell them negative would like to continue on the planned arrival route or can we get a few more track miles and air traffic control always knows what that means and they will always comply if you can't do that you'll have to tell air traffic control that listen can we go in to this fix and do one turn in a holding pattern perfectly okay all right? It does not matter why you want to do this, air traffic control will make sure that it happens. All right? So never feel forced to take a shortcut and then start to chase, because that will bring us into the next problem here. And that has to do with pilot workload. All right? So if you get one of these shortcuts and you accept it, and you start realizing that you are a thousand or two thousand feet high on profile, you'll be able to see that normally on our VNAV path display, um, which tells us that ooh, if you do this, you're gonna be really, really high. Well, then you're gonna need to start doing things. You can, for example, use your speed brake. You can also use, you can also slow down and start taking flaps. Because remember, the flaps have speed restrictions to them, right? You cannot take flaps at every given speed. And if we're coming in at 280 knots, for example, then we're not allowed to take any flaps, which means we can't get that um, extra drag out. So that means that you need to slow down first. But of course, remember the different energy states? If you take away the kinetic energy, which is what you're doing when you slow down, well, in that case, you will probably have to increase your potential energy because you're not destroying any energy here. You're just ch changing in between them. In order to destroy energy, you need to add a drag. And that's what we're trying to do when we're extending flaps. So you see your high, bring the speed back. This will just make you higher now because the aircraft will not descend and decelerate at the same time. It will go almost level and then the speed will come rushing off as you're sitting with the closed thrust levels maintaining the altitude the speed comes down and as it comes down below the limit speed you can start taking flaps and as you do so now you're adding drag now you're actually destroying energy okay but now you're ending up even higher than that and if you have too little track mass to go until you're supposed to get stabilized on the approach you might not be able to make it so once again here's the time to tell air traffic control that you need more track mass all right nothing wrong with that so now you're sitting here, you can use speed brakes together with flaps down to, in the 77 to flaps 10. Above flaps 10, you're not allowed to use speed brakes anymore, all right? There is too much uh, air that's going to separate over the, the trailing edge flaps. If you do so, there's going to be too much buffeting. It's not safe, so we don't do that. But you also have the landing gear. The landing gear is not designed to be used as a speed brake, but if you are below the safe speed and you do extend the landing gear, it will provide you with an enormous amount of drag. Right? So that can be used in certain circumstances. But generally, what we are teaching is that if you find yourself in a situation where you need to take the gear, uh, especially 
lower down, closer to your uh, stabilized criteria altitude, which is 1,000 feet and 500 feet. We'll get to that in a second. If that's the case, it's probably better just to ask for track miles rather than taking the gear because you're now coming into the zone where you can start making some serious mistakes. So as you're taking gear down now and flaps and reducing the speed, your descent rate is going to increase quite a lot. All right? Perfectly okay if you're far out, but the closer you get to the ground, the, the less good that is. And we were talking about workload. Since the pilot flying now is most likely solely kind of trying to chase the, uh, the altitude, get down onto the profile, his or her attention span is going to go way, way down. And the higher you are, the more stressful it will become, the more the pilot flying is going to try to do whatever he or she can to get the aircraft down. Right? Pilot monitoring is likely going to do the same. Pilot monitoring is going to sit there and it's going to try to calculate and see what's going on. Also talking to our traffic control. And the workload for the crew goes up. As the workload goes up, some strange things happen to us humans. Right? And one of the things is that when the stress is really high, we stop hearing things. We stop hearing warning sounds. We stop hearing voices from our traffic control or even from our pilot monitoring. So when you are deep down into the stress cone, you might start doing things and not noticing things that would be perfectly impossible to understand when you're listening to, for example, voice recordings. How come that they didn't hear the stall warning or the too low flaps, too low gear warnings? I mean, that's because the stress is down so high and they're so far down into the stress cone that the hearing has disappeared. Now they only see and they only react to what they see, right? Um, so this can happen if you drive yourself really far down into the stress cone. And the way to mitigate against this is that someone needs to come in and say, stop, right? It can be the pilot flying, it can be the pilot monitoring. In some cases, it can be air traffic control, but it has to be down to the flight crew. And at some point, you need to say, no, no further. I'm not going to continue with this. Now, in order to help pilots take these decisions, we have put in force something called stabilized approach criteria. Okay? Stabilized approach criteria uh, means, and I'm going to get to the individual points very soon, but at a certain point, if we are in clouds, as in IMC, in instrument meteorological conditions, we need to be stabilized on the approach at a thousand feet above ground level. If we are in VMC, so visual meteorological conditions, we need to be stabilized at 500 feet. And these are the latest points. We should be stabilized way outside of that. But the point is that at these points, the pilot monitoring has the ability to say, go around, right? If we are not within these criteria, and they are very, very clear, strict criteria, you cannot continue the approach. You're not allowed to. You have to go around. And it's the pilot monitoring job to verify this and say, okay, 1,000 feet, not stabilized, go around. And if the pilot flying does not kind of listen to that, the pilot monitoring has the chance to actually either call a second time, you have to call a second time, but if you continue after that, you could potentially take control as well. However, that's very rare. So what are these criteria then? Well, the aircraft needs to be on the correct flight path, right? This means that you need to be, if you're flying an instrument landing system, an ILS, you need to be within one dot localizer or glide slope deflection. It means that it's very, very minimal flight path changes needed. So in the example that we were giving before, if you're chasing from above and you haven't gotten down to your glide slope yet, you're not stabilized, right? So you need to be pretty much where you're supposed to be. You also need to make sure that you're at the correct speed because remember the different energy states. So if you're on the ILS, you're on the glide slope, you've chased it down, so you're on it, but your speed is way too high, you're still not stabilized. You're sitting with the thrust levels closed. You probably have not been able to achieve the, the um, configuration that you need with flaps and gear and so on. So you're not stabilized. And the speed window that we have, that we're allowed to be, is between VREF, which is the uh, reference approach speed, to VREF plus 15, up to a maximum of VREF plus 20, right? So you have 20 knots that you need to be inside. If you're not, you're not stabilized, you go around. 
The next thing that you need to make sure that you have is your configuration being correct. This means the gear down, the flaps where they're supposed to be, and the stabilized criteria then need to be at the landing flaps. So at 1000 feet IMC you have flaps 30 or flaps 40, depending on what you're going to do. Uh, and the same at 500 feet VMC. All right. And the way obviously to know that you are is that your checklist needs to be complete. The only point that can be missing from the landing checklist at this point is the landing clearance because the landing clearance can come later on, especially if you're coming into a busy airport like London Heathrow or Los Angeles or something like that. So landing checklist complete all the way down to clear to land, basically. Also, your descent rate needs to be correct. Um, this means that you cannot be sitting with 1500, 2000 feet per minute descent rate. You shouldn't be sitting with 200 feet per minute descent rate either. On an ILS, on a 3 degrees glide, you should be around 750 feet per minute. Okay? If you are more than 1000 feet per minute, it needs to have been pre briefed because there are some approaches which are steeper because of surrounding terrain, for example. In that case, you can have a final descent rate of more than 1000 feet, but it needs to have been pre briefed. Right? It cannot be something you're sitting on a normal ILS and you have a really high descent rate because you could be on a faulty glide slope. There are different ILS lobes, as in the way that the glide slope works is that you have two different frequencies that intersect with each other and when they intersect perfectly you know you're on the right glide. Okay? But the problem with these um, radio lobes is that they reproduce several times. So you have lobes at 3 degrees, 6 degrees, 9 degrees and so on. If, you're on, uh, if you have been chasing the, um, the path from above, there is a possibility that you might latch on to an incorrect ILS lobe. And the way, one of the ways to find that out is that you might have an extremely high descent rate, even though the, it looks like you're perfectly on the glide. Okay, so that's another thing. Now the last thing is that you need to have appropriate trust for the configuration you have, right? So why they say appropriate trust is because that differs with your weight. So, for example, if you have flaps 40 on a 60 ton 737, you should be about 60% N1. If you have flaps 30 on a 60 ton aircraft, it's about 3% less, so about 57, something like that. And it follows the weight quite closely. So that means that if you're flying an almost empty aircraft, you can be as low as 48, 49, something like that. It would be perfectly possible to do. And the reason we're saying that is because if you have, once again, come in really hot and high, you might be sitting with thrust levels closed, okay? And it takes a while, even from approach idle, where the idle uh, on the engine is a little bit higher than normal, it still takes a while for the thrust to kind of spool up and give you full go around thrust if you need it. So if you're sitting dead sticking, as we call it, the thrust completely closed, well then you are not in the safe zone. You should be sitting at approach thrust, so if you need to go around, add thrust and the, um, the aircraft responds almost immediately to it all right so all of these criteria have to be fulfilled right if any single one of these criteria is not fulfilled the pilot monitoring calls go around you execute a go around and no one will ever blame you that's another thing that you need to understand about the airline world you're never blamed for a go around you might have to write a report about it if it's below a certain altitude, but that's more for statistical purposes, to know and also to, to track. Does this happen often at one particular airport? Well, then maybe there's something with the airspace or the airport that needs to be sorted out. But you, as a crew, will never be blamed for doing a go-around under any circumstance, right? Under no circumstance. A go-around is, in 99% of the cases, the absolute safest thing to do. All right? So remember that. If you feel weird, if something looks, looks odd, if you have a warning, if you have a failure, if you are not just feel a bit off, you go around, sort out the go around, you have more time, you can sort out whatever problem you have and you can come in and do a perfectly safe approach on the second attempt. Okay? Now, we touched a little bit on emergencies here and in most cases where you see really severe mistakes being made, it is because something in the aircraft is not working. It might be a technical issue uh, or it might be something that the flight crew has done, you know, which has caused a technical issue. And in any case, a technical malfunction 
on approach, if you're coming in hot and high, takes away even further the um, ability of the crew to take rational decisions. Because some of the attention is going to be to trying to figure out what the fault is and do something about it. And this is yet another reason why you have to go around. Okay, you need that time to go through the non-normal checklist to make sure that that issue is solved and then come in and do a landing. You don't want to sit on approach, especially if you're hot and high, trying to deal with something because then you might miss something else. And this brings us to today's case study. Now, the video that you're about to see, um, it's an animation coming from the final report of the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, in the United States. And it will reenact the last couple of minutes of flight 8284 of Empire Airlines. It's an ATR-42 flown into um, Lubbock International Airport. It's very early in the morning, 0430 local time. It's in freezing fog. The pilot flying is the first officer. She has about 2,100 hours of total time and about 130 hours on the type. And the captain has about 14,000 hours and about 1,900 hours on the type. So let's have a look and see what happens here. Now, as the video starts here, um, we are about 1,500 feet above ground, flying about 160 feet, uh, knots of airspeed. The Trust is set to normal stage for this stage of flight. Um, there is no flaps out, okay? They just received a clearance to land and runway, so at this point, everything looks fine. Now, this, you can see the speed is sitting more or less stable at about 160 knots, where it should be. And then now we're asking for gear down and flaps 15. And as you can see on the right side of the screen there, it's only the left flap that comes out, not the right. So you have some kind of technical malfunction here. Um, call, they're asking for landing checklist and they're referring to something called glide slope star here which is likely the glide slope indication on the primary flight display. Um, at this point you can tell that the crew is starting to feel a little bit uneasy about something. This is an altitude alert and the first officer is asking what's going on here. The captain is trying to figure out what's going on. And as you can see, the airspeed has now crept down almost 20 knots or 25 knots from where we were in the beginning, but the flaps has not changed. So this means they're going closer to a stall. Now they're passing a thousand feet. So this is where they're in IMC. They should go around if they're not happy with the situation. The flaps are not out. And now they're getting into intermittent stall warnings as well. The captain tells the first officer to fly the aircraft. The first officer wants to go around and ask for it, but the captain tells her to keep descending. First officer clearly not happy with this, and the captain takes over the controls, struggles with the controls. Remember, the flaps are still not out. Now reduces thrust to idle, passes 500 feet, and getting continuous stick shaker here. Now I have to remind you that the continuous stick shaker means an, uh, um, stall escape maneuver, no matter where it happens. But here the captain sees the runway. So start aiming for the runway. Instead, continues to descend. The speed is now down to 125 knots. Uh, stick shaker comes on, the aircraft comes into an aerodynamic stall, and at this point the aircraft impacts the runway, or impacts prior to the runway, skids about 1,000 meters, ends up to the right of the runway, and um, the aircraft catches fire. All right. Both crew members survived this incident with minor injuries. The aircraft was completely written off. And when the National Transportation Safety Board came out with their final report, they said that the, the likely causes of the crash was the aircraft's inability to monitor their instruments and realizing that, you know, that they were descending with too low speed, with a too high descent rate, and inability to follow the standard operating procedures which stipulated a go-around in case of a unstabilized approach, together with a few other items, okay? The aircrew was continued to fly after this, but there were changes to how um, airlines were uh, practicing flight in icing conditions and re-emphasis on the uh, um, stabilized approach criteria and the fact that you need to go around if you find yourself in an unstabilized approach, no matter what the reason is. 
Right guys, I hope you like these type of videos. Uh, if you do, consider subscribing to the channel and highlighting the notification bell. Make sure you highlight the all notifications because I do sometimes videos spontaneously that might not come out on Fridays or I do live streams and I do interviews with other pilots. And if you have the little notification bell on, it means that you will get a notification whenever I do this, okay? A huge thank you once again to my Patreon crew. If you're interested in joining my Patreon crew, there are links here, basically patreon.com slash mentorpilot. Go in, check it out and see if it's something for you. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.